And we're back for episode four, and we're heading to Loris's birthmark. Is there a Loris's birthmark master plan? We shall see. And the city of... Dorne. I specifically remember people saying Sunspear. I think the audience can keep up. And we start out with Jorah stealing a boat. I'm not sure why he's stealing a boat. In the show, there's no war in Slaver's Bay, so trade should still be going there. Jorah even pays the guy for the boat, so it wasn't lack of money. Jorah apparently just wanted to punch somebody in the face. And we flash to a bigger ship. Is it Ironborn? Is it Ironborn? Is it Ironborn? Nah, it's just Jamie. He sees the Sapphire Isles and longs for Brienne. So do I, Jamie. So do I. Now in the holds, Bronn asks Jamie why exactly they're stealing Marcella instead of just sending troops down to get her. And Jamie says it's because he doesn't want to start a war. Tristan and Marcella are betrothed. It was part of a peace deal. How is clandestinely stealing Marcella not going to start a war? Maybe they'll explain this later. Back in King's Landing, we find out that the Iron Bank is asking for 10% of its loan back. I guess Cersei hasn't heard about their loan to Stannis? Because Cersei should be paying none of her debt back to them. They're financing a rebel king. Mace Tyrell offers to pay the debt, so it's not really a problem. Nonetheless, Cersei orders Mace Tyrell to go to Bravos to get rid of him. I'm not sure how Cersei had everything already set up to send Mace Tyrell to Bravos. He just announced the debt problem. Ah well, I guess Cersei has been reading Mace Tyrell's books. In our next scene, Cersei decides to arm the Faith Militant. Hmm, weird that she didn't ask for any debt forgiveness. She didn't ask for anything from the Faith. I mean, other than the arrest of Loras. Anyway, next we get a montage, montage. You can pass some time in a montage, montage. And it all ends with Olivar not being scared enough until he finally sees someone get stabbed. And then we get this cartoonist scene. Ugh, I, I don't even want to talk about it. And then Loras gets arrested, and Loras says, Who do you think you are? And Lancel says, Justice. But really the scene should have gone, Who do you think you are? And Lancel should have said, it's me, Lancel. We've met like 15 times. Your sister is married to my cousin's son. Yeah, I used to have long hair and I filled out a bit, but we used to live in the same castle for like years. I've been on like 60 hunts with your ex-boyfriend Renly, and we both received honors together after the Battle of the Blackwater. We've totally met, dude. Now in our next scene, Marjorie confronts the Wimpy King. Now if you remember, back during the tourney on Joffrey's name day, Tommen was actually established as a bold and courageous character. Well... I guess people change. So next, Tommen demands that Cersei release Loras, and Cersei hides behind the very weak excuse that it's not her holding Loras. I mean, I imagine it's only been a couple weeks. She installed the High Sparrow and then armed him, but then isn't responsible for his actions? This is a really tough pill to swallow, and I'm surprised there aren't hundreds of lords already protesting Cersei. I mean, the prostitution and wine trades are already disrupted. There should be hell to pay. Anyway, Tommen tries to talk to the High Sparrow, but can't figure out how to do it without violence. And I'm sure for this moment, Marjorie wishes she was still married to Joffrey. Obviously, Tommen is meant to contrast Joffrey, and I think we all know how Joffrey would have handled this scene. In the next scene, Sam and John are trying to get more men at the Wall, and they have a little disagreement about whether they should request help from the Boltons. I'm pretty sure that everyone knows that Roose isn't sending Jack to the Wall. And then we get this scene, HBO TNA. And Melisandre tells Jon, You know nothing, Jon Snow. Oh my god, so spooky, how does she know? Now this exchange is in the book as well, but I never actually liked it very much. I mean, lots of wildlings knew about Egret and Jon's relationship, so I guess Melisandre's been talking to them. And I would imagine that most people would come to this conclusion as well. But in both the book and the show, it's like, Oh my gosh, she knows so much, she's been seeing it in her flames. And then we have this scene, which is absolutely incredible. I mean, it's the most powerful, incredible, touching scene that I've seen in Game of Thrones. It's absolutely positively impossible not to root for Stannis at this point. One thing that George R. R. Martin has not done well is establishing Stannis as an unlikable character. Everyone in Westeros supposedly finds Stannis unlikable, and yet a lot of book readers love Stannis. And I don't know many that hate him. He's strong, clever, kind of funny in a weird way, and yet he supposedly doesn't inspire anyone. So I guess I like how the show has just decided, you know what, we're going to make him a hero. Now next we get Littlefinger explaining the story of Rhaegar and Lyanna. Now this seems to be a mix of what Eddard and Barristan Selmy both thought about the event. But of course Barristan is a very simple man, and so his opinions aren't really to be trusted. Could war have been prevented had Harrenhal gone differently? Probably not. That's Barristan Selmy's simplicity, 
which doesn't really fit coming out of Littlefinger's mouth. And does Littlefinger really care about the greater good? Eh, probably not. Then again, we don't know what lies Littlefinger is trying to feed to Sansa. Now Littlefinger reveals some very weird and interesting information. Stannis is the favorite. He has the larger army and is expected to take the north. Wow, that is a big change, but at the same time, it makes King's Landing not make any sense at all. If Stannis is such a big threat, why hasn't the Iron Throne sent any troops north? One can't ignore him like he's a defeated foe if he's not a defeated foe. And why isn't the Iron Throne furious with the Iron Bank? Stannis got a loan that's so large that he has a bigger army than the Boltons? Meanwhile, off on Loras' birthmark, Jaime doesn't eat his breakfast. What a waste. Snake is delicious. And we get a huge fight scene in which Jamie must be exhausted because he has an empty stomach. And then Jamie insists that they bury the bodies, despite Bronn's objections. Do you know how long it'll take to bury these bodies, he says? Which is hilarious because in the next scene we have the Sand Snakes, and we have this guy. That must have taken all morning, Sand Snakes. Kind of pointless. Did he need to be buried up to his neck to torture him with scorpions? And then Ilaria says that everyone must choose which path they should take, war or peace. Wait, so people's loyalties are in question at this point? Because Alaria just gave away the plan. What would Alaria have done had one of the Sand Snakes said, No, I'm going with peace. Not too smart, Alaria. Not too smart. Now, Obara tells a really weird and supposedly inspirational tale, but I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. So Oberyn, who's been a deadbeat dad his whole life, suddenly shows up to take Obara away from her mother. Quite logically, the mother cries quite a bit that her child is being taken away. Oberyn calls those tears weapons and offers Obara a spear instead. In the end, Obara goes off with Oberyn. So she is completely and utterly psychotic. What human being would leave their mother who raised them to go off with some guy they've never met? Even accepting that Obara's mother is a prostitute doesn't answer this question. No human being would make that choice. Meanwhile, back in Essos, Tyrion is tired of being gagged. I think he starts singing the Meow Meow Mix song. The Dink absolutely owns this scene, but I should say that on a boat that size, it'll take forever to get to Slaver's Bay. Meanwhile in Marine, things are quiet enough that Barristan tells Danny about Rhaegar a little bit. Apparently Show Rhaegar was a much happier kind of guy. The Sons of the Harpy cause some trouble, and they have a fight with the Unsullied. Now this seems to be a 13 on 8 fight. I really would have thought the Unsullied would have done better. I mean, the Unsullied have spent their entire lives training for war, and the Sons of the Harpy are supposedly just regular guys. The Unsullied have spears and shields, and the Sons of the Harpy only have daggers and a few swords. In this fight, the Unsullied don't even take out a single son. I am really beginning to question the quality of Astapori training. Had she not stolen the Unsullied in the first place, she should totally ask for a refund. I mean, had she not killed all the Astapori slavers. And Barristan gets stabbed. Now many of you probably expected me to freak out about this. After all, I'm a butthurt book fan. But here's the thing, I don't mind that the show is different from the book. In fact, I want the show to be different from the book. Mainly because I don't want the show to spoil the book. I only get disappointed when something awesome is removed, or something is changed and it just doesn't make sense. If the show wants to kill Barristan and Grey Worm, go for it. Just have it make sense and make it be a good story. Some people wonder, is this spoiling the book? Should we expect Grey Worm and Barristan to die at the Battle of Fire? Well, first of all, everyone is going to die eventually. It's not a spoiler to kill somebody. But second, Daenerys' story is almost completely off book now. There's no Quentin, there's no Victarion. How could it possibly be the same? So that's all I have for episode 4. See you again in episode 5.